Welcome to the Wild Trout Man 2020 Susquehanna River Watershed year-end review. I have some nice photographs to share and better late than never. The idea is to present all of my favorite shots from last year in video format. So sit back, relax, and let me take you on a peaceful year-long journey featuring my passion for fly fishing and cold clean water for wild and native trout. There are a few stock trout mixed in for the ride, along with the most beautiful environment where these lovely fish are found. The soundtrack is from a project I have of original music I wrote under the name Holomind. I hope you enjoy this audio visual experience. Twenty twenty was quite the year with the pandemic, but I made it a point to fly fish as much as possible while my office was closed. Social distancing on some spectacular trout streams is very good medicine for the soul, and free time is a luxury, so I tried my best to maximize this time off from work and use it wisely. Susquehanna River watershed, including the north, west, and main branches, encompasses over 27,000 square miles and includes such magical and hallowed waters as Penns Creek, Spring Creek, Little Juniata River, Spruce Creek, Lackawanna River, Kettle Creek, Yellow Breaches, the La Torte, Pine Creek, Slate Run, the Lowell Sock, and Fishing Creek. The list is long and many more streams could be added. Pennsylvania is blessed with the most rivers, streams, and creeks in the lower 48 states, and much of this is the Susquehanna River watershed. I also spend quite a bit of time on the Delaware River watershed, including the Lehigh River and its tributaries, but that's a video for another time. I made it a point to fish all of the incredible Susquehanna River watershed streams that I mentioned and as many lesser known but maybe even more magical smaller Class A wild trout streams. These Class A gems along with the natural reproduction and wilderness experience streams are some of the best opportunities to catch wild trout in an absolutely stunning environment. Fishing these streams is known as blue lining, so named because they are represented by a small blue line on a topographic map. Bowman's Creek is another important stream for me, which is the home water for our Stanley Cooper Trout Unlimited chapter. We have done a number of stream improvement projects over the years in Bowman's in conjunction with the Luzerne Conservation District. Some of those projects include stream bank stabilization, tree plantings, and adding tons of limestone in the headwaters of the creek. Eastern Pennsylvania Coalition for Abandoned Mine Reclamation and the Middle Susquehanna River Keeper Association are also two fine environmental organizations I am involved with, and they have had many projects to help improve the water quality on the Susquehanna River watershed. Each fly fishing trip was an adventure, and all were memorable. The fly fishing season started slowly in the early part of the year. January and February are tough months to present a fly, but you can still find some active fish when the sun sneaks through the tree canopy and warms the water, which can get the trout feeding for a while in the afternoon. 
If the fish weren't cooperating, I always had my camera with which to photograph Mother Nature's breathtaking works of art. Often, there was as much time spent trying to line up the perfect camera shot as there was deciding which fly to try next to entice a discerning wild trout. So take a moment to look around and you will see her stunning work in every direction. And it's not just the sights, but the sounds of the birds singing, the crickets chirping, a lone distant airplane, or snow crunching under your boot. Also, the smells of the forest after a soaking rain, or the streamside meadow when the flowers are in bloom. This sensory overload was an additional reward while out hunting for wild trout in Pennsylvania. And it is like hunting, because you need to be in stealth or commando mode. It's critical while out on the stream trying to catch these wily finned creatures. If they see you, they immediately dart for cover, and your chance of seeing their beauty up close and personal is not going to happen. Any unnatural movement they see means there's a good chance a predator is out looking for a meal, so the trout quickly take cover under a submerged tree root or an undercut bank. And though I mentioned the word hunting, no trout were harmed on these adventures. All trout were gently released to live another day and possibly provide another angler the joy of catching and witnessing their undeniable beauty. March is when the fly fishing started to pick up and really become promising. By April, it was prime time with abundant hatching mayflies and caddisflies and stoneflies as well. A welcoming and exciting sight, especially when there are rising trout feeding on these emerging Hendrickson's, Quill Gordon's, Blooming Olives, and Sulphur mayflies later in the spring. As the duns hatch, they float in the current like little sailboats, drying their wings before taking off into the wind. As these macroinvertebrates crawl and wiggle out from their nymphal shuck, they metamorphose as they swim to the surface. This is when they become most vulnerable to cruising trout. In the evening, after mating, these mayflies return to the water to lay their eggs. Some mayflies drop their eggs while flying above the water, while others land on the water with their wings outstretched. These evening spinner falls are the mayflies dying after mating. It's game over for this generation of macros, but from death, comes life, as this is happy hour for the trout, as well as the trout fishermen. Now the trout can swim comfortably, expending very little energy while continuously sipping mouthfuls of spent wing mayfly spinners in the slack water. This is prime time for the knowledgeable fly fisher. Fly fishing is an incredible sport. It's a never-ending learning experience that in order to master, takes patience, practice, and perseverance. The depth of knowledge needed can seem intimidating, but taking one step at a time can lead to a lifelong love of this phenomenal sport. Fly fishing is an art found in the beautifully hand-tied flies of feather and fur used to catch these wickedly lovely wild trout in an environment that is as stunning as you will possibly encounter. Lush forest of hemlock and rhododendron with steep mountainous ravines, tumbling plunge pools and waterfalls carved into a scene straight out of Middle Earth. Ferns, mushrooms, moss, and sedge grass. It's a botanical laboratory in which the timing of the flowering plants directly coincides with the science of matching the hatch of the different stream macroinvertebrates. When the forsythia blooms, you can expect to see blue quill mayflies on the water and the ravenous trout breaking the water's surface as they sip in a nutritious and tasty meal. When the lilacs are in bloom, pale morning duns will be hatching and the eyes of the trout will be fixed on the water's surface, scanning for the telltale sign of the silhouette of mayfly wings drifting and dancing in the current. There is a rhythm to the flow of nature, 
a cycle of symbiosis. There are nymphs in larval and pupal stage, adult duns and spinners, as well as summer insects on the water, including terrestrials such as ants, grasshoppers, and beetles. Trout fishing flies are meticulously tied to represent and imitate any and all of these winged invertebrates. Fly fishing is also an adventure in accessing the amazing remote locations where many of these fish are found. All you need is a topographic map, sturdy boots, and a lust for the unknown, and soon your outdoor spirit will be fully captivated. The adventure in discovering a new stream, and the never-ending wonderment of what lies around the next bend in that stream, is just so exciting. Add in the Zen experience aspect of fly fishing, the meditative back and forth casting motion of using your fly rod to gently present a fly on the water while you are in total peace and solitude and you have magic like few other experiences can offer. Fly fishing nirvana is when all of these elements come together, when the sights and sounds of the wild trout stream serenade your soul. I highly recommend the experience. unpolluted, cold, clean, well-oxygenated water with a good pH. These are direct indicators through the overall quality of the natural stream environment and as to whether a particular stream can sustain native trout. If there are no trout, then the water has issues with chemical or organic waste pollution. Other factors can be the pH is too acidic from acid rain and the burning of fossil fuels, the water temperature being too warm from lack of shade trees, a stream channel that has become too wide and shallow from erosion as a result of flooding, or rainwater runoff warmed by hot summer asphalt before the water empties into the stream. Waterways that are no longer pristine will not have a quality wild trout population, if any. I can only imagine how amazing these wild trout fisheries were before the forests were clear-cut in the late 1800s. Now there is less shade and more silt from erosion without the old-growth forests. The old growth hemlocks were so huge that the forest canopy was enormous, and that helped absorb rainwater, diffusing potential damage from a flash flood. These forests helped water to be released more slowly, lessening the threat of flooding. The streams were less likely to get blown out and become flat and channelized, which is not an environment conducive to prime wild trout habitat. If you watch my other Wild Trout Man YouTube videos, you know what I think are the most important factors in catching a wild and native trout. As I already stated in this video, the number one factor in catching wild trout is making sure the fish do not see you. You can do everything else perfectly, but if the trout sees you, it doesn't matter. Any movement they see will spook them into hiding. So like an animal of the forest, you need to move slowly as you stalk your prey. You may need to kneel down or cast from behind a tree. Staying low is key, and also casting upstream so the fish is less likely to see you will certainly improve your chances of catching more trout. The next most important factor is a long, soft, precision cast. Your first cast is the most important. Make it count. Every subsequent cast has greater chance of spooking the fish with the line hitting the water, the shadow of your fly line going across the water, 
the glint of your fly rod in the sun, the noise of your boots scraping across rocks, or your flies zipping across the water unnaturally. Which brings us to our third factor. Make sure your fly is floating at the same speed as the current. This is critical. Your fly is made to imitate a natural insect, make sure it acts like one, and floats naturally. You can judge the speed of your fly with the bubbles coming downstream in the current. They should be moving together in unison. If not, mend your fly line to help with the slack and keep your rod tip high. You want as little fly line on the water as possible to help have a natural drift. The next most important factor is what fly to choose. Again, it doesn't matter what fly you select if you haven't done the previous points correctly. Matching a specific hatch is the science of fly fishing. Many books have been written on this subject, and many more will continue to be written as we learn more about the science of matching the hatch. In general, when there is not a specific hatch going on, I use an attractor dry fly that floats well to entice these eager and opportunistic feeders. A royal wolf, a yellow humpy, an osable wolf, or my creation, an easy to tie, easy to see, and super effective Super Adams dry fly. It's a traditional Adams dry fly that is already a killer pattern with a mix of grizzly and brown hackle, but it is beefed up with polypropylene wings and tail. It floats like a charm. A second sinking fly, an all-purpose nymph such as the traditional pheasant tail, hare's ear, or prince nymph tied in at the bend of the hook and extending down 12 to 18 inches from the dry fly is a great way to attack these fish using a two-fly dry dropper system. The dry fly catches many fish and also acts as a strike indicator for the nymph, which also catches many fish. Stream depth and time of year are the two most important factors for me when choosing one or two flies. Early season with deeper, faster flows is usually two flies, and as the weather warms and the trout start looking to the surface, it's time to lose the nymph and make things much easier casting amongst the trees by exclusively going with a single dry fly. If you are a dad or a mom or an aunt or uncle or a big brother or sister, take someone fishing. Introduce them to this incredible sport. Let them experience the beauty and develop an appreciation of nature and the environment. We need to teach each other to be the guardians of our incredible home and not the destroyers of this land for our immediate short-sighted gain. We like to think we are the dominant species with a conscience and made in God's eye. It's time we start acting that way and understand the intricacies of how all life is interconnected and dependent on each other. You cannot wipe out one genus or species and expect it not to affect other species before the whole system is in disarray. So if you have grandkids, take them fishing so we can create a generation of environmental hope for this planet. summer months were very dry, which made conditions difficult to find sufficient flowing water with respectable cooler temperatures. Flows were minimal even moving into the autumn spawning season. The leaves turned to the brilliant hues of orange, yellow, and red, their glorious autumnal colors. Then they started their elaborate gentle dance of slowly but relentlessly falling to the ground, replenishing the soil with a fresh layer of nutrients. It was then the rains finally came and the spawn was on. The next generation of these resilient creatures was in the works. How awesome. How I love finding wild trout in a small remote mountain stream. The beauty, the solitude, the serenity, the excitement, the adventure, the glorious unspoiled works of nature around every bend. 
a garden of Eden of trees, rocks, clouds, and a bubbling brook, all painted together in a mesmerizing, ever-changing tapestry of sight and sound, overwhelming the senses and just ever so heavenly. Overall, I had a wonderful year exploring new water and fishing some old favorites. We are blessed in Pennsylvania to have so many miles of stream in the Susquehanna River watershed. We need to do our best to protect this incredible natural resource. If you like what you have seen, check out my website at www.wildtroutman.com or search Wild Troutman on YouTube. All the best to you in 2021, and until next time, Wild Troutman. Thank you for watching, and long live the native and wild trout.